Okay, I think. Okay, yeah, we are live. Perfect. Great, great, great. This is good. And so I'm going to start letting people in. All righty. Perfect. This is exciting, okay. I'm going to get the YouTube live link because I'm going to share this as well. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, just to echo what Jamie said, thank you so much for, for being here today and for, for taking part in this. Um, and yeah, just always appreciate the time that people make for this. Yes, this is going to be so great. So we're just gonna wait like a couple of minutes for folks to come in more and to everyone coming in, feel free to share where you're from, your pronouns um, and what really brings you here today as we celebrate um, Dr. Francesca Soban's pu the publishing or her, her publishing of, of her book, her amazing book, The Digital Lives of Black Men in Britain, and also um, her wonderful teaching as well. So we're super excited. All righty. So we're just going to wait one more moment for others to come in. And then there's also folks on YouTube Live. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it so much. And also, if you're on YouTube, feel free to share where you're from, uh, your pronouns, and what brings you here. Obviously, it's amazing, this amazing teaching, but, you know. Hi, Jasmine from Detroit. Thank you for being here with us. Hi. Hey, Ploy. Thank you for being with us from London. We appreciate it. I hope I'm saying your name correctly and forgive me if I have not. Hi. Hello from London. Oh, I have been to other talks by Francesca and love her work. Yeah. Ah, thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Great, great, great. So, hi, George from London. How are you doing? Hi, Millie. Thanks for being here. Keela, nice to DC, yes. Wow, great, great, great. Hi, John from Toronto. Roya, nice to meet you. Patrice from Barbados, whoop, whoop. Hello, Demita from Maryland. This is really great. This is super exciting. Well, let me get started before I start shouting out where everyone's from, like we're at some party, okay? <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Swift. I am the executive director of Black Men Radicals and the School for Black Feminist Politics. It is really nice for you all to be here. Um, just thank you for constantly supporting the mission and vision and values of Black Men Radicals, which is to uplift and center Black women and gender expansive peoples, radical activism in Africa and the African diaspora. I am really so glad to introduce the wonderful uh, Dr. Francesca Soban um, and that welcoming her for leading this wonderful teaching 
on Black women's media experiences in Britain and the rise of brand woke washing. But before I properly introduce our wonderful guests, I just want to explain how I do at every uh, meeting and every Zoom webinar event that we have to reiterate that this is a safe space. We do not accept any oppressive language, no homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia, ableism, massage and war, white supremacy, anti-blackness, you name it, we don't accept it. And if you cannot abide by this safe space or the rules of the safe space, I will kick you out. So please respect our guests. And also thank you to Nina, our wonderful captioner for being with us and for the amazing work that she does. So we, we appreciate you so much. Thank you, Nina. So let me introduce our amazing guest, Dr. Francesca Sobond. Dr. Francesca Sobond is a lecturer in digital media studies. Um, I'm sorry, was, this is blocking me. At the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University. She is a course director of the BA Media, Journalism and Culture Program and is an affiliate of the Data Justice Lab. Francesca's work focuses on digital culture, black diaspora, feminism, creative work and the experiences of black women in Britain. She is the author of The Digital Lives of Black Women in, what, black women in Britain. Congratulations, we have her copy. Thank you. <laughs> and is co-editor with Professor Akwugu Imajulu of To Exist is to Resist Black Feminism in Europe. You can follow Francesca, Dr. Soban at Chess S, which I'll put in the, the comments shortly, and learn more about her work at francescasoban.com. Um, before um, I... Uh, let Dr. Saban have the floor. I just wanna um, tell you all that Dr. Saban's teaching is the launch of Black Radicals Afrofeminisms in Europe series. And the series aims to be a political interrogation, meditation and celebration of European Afrofeminisms and Black feminisms. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Saban. And I give you the floor to discuss your wonderful teaching on Black women's media experiences in Britain and the rise of brand woke washing. Thank you. I just wanted to start off by saying a huge thank you to Jamie and to Nina as well. And to just say I recognise the massive amount of work that goes into all of what is involved in Black Women Radicals. And just to say thank you for making the time and, and making the space to have this conversation tonight. I know that it is a teaching of sorts, but I hope that there is a lot of discussion surrounding it as well. And yeah, I just, just, I'm always in awe of what Jamie is doing and what's going on with Black Women Radicals. So yeah, just starting by saying a huge thank you with regards to all of that. So today I'm going to be speaking quite a lot about work that is to do with the digital lives of Black women in Britain. And I'll also discuss some related research and thoughts that I've been having to do with the different ways we've seen brands essentially trying to make use of representations and rhetoric that in different ways might be associated with social justice movements and black activism. So that work really deals with this notion of woke washing. And I use that term with a lot of ambivalence. Um, I'm, I'm well aware of the way in which the notion of being woke has been very much emptied of meaning. Its origins have been erased. And the reality of the, the underpinning black politics that was once more obviously connected to that term has very much been decentered and reframed within a lot of mainstream media and political spaces. So it's a, a, a teaching focusing on, on two different but related um, issues and experiences, the digital lives of black women in Britain and the ways that brands are often trying to position themselves in proximity to black people and more specifically are trying to tap into what black women are doing online as, as a, a way to pursue profit, but often to try and imply that the brand themselves is somehow um, involved in activism or somehow substantially supporting grassroots organizing when we know brands are as far away from any form of liberationist work that is probably imaginable. So I'm just going to share my, let's see these slides, hopefully, um, if technology is on my side, you can hopefully, um, hopefully they're, they're visible at your end. And I'm just going to talk through some different questions, some different examples of what I've been looking at as part of this work to do with Black women's media experiences in Britain with an emphasis on digital, but I will also try to provide some 
background context in terms of thinking of the history of Black women's media experiences and forms of collective organising in relation to that. And then I'll wrap up by speaking more so about these forms of consumer culture and these elements of branding acti activity, which is very much about trying to often make use of um, essentially sometimes steal, poach and co-opt the digital work and the digital content commentaries and knowledge production of black women. So the slide is sticking at the moment. Let's see, right. So we've spoken a little bit about these two different elements of today's teaching. And moving on to a, a brief mention of my book, um, I, I know that Jamie's already spoken about this and I just wanted to highlight that at the moment there is a uh, daily deal where you can get my book for $9.99 and um, that's um, in, in pounds or $9.99 in terms of dollars but I also wanted to mention my book at this point because there are two open access chapters and you can actually access the entire book open access through the brilliant Free Black University so I also think it's helpful to speak about that first of all because what the Free Black University is doing is phenomenal and if you're not already aware of them then I always encourage people to find out more about what they do and the different ways you can support them and I also just like to mention this because I know that there are different reasons that people may or may not be able to access my book in other ways so it was just to mention that you can find out more about it and um, through these different channels. So how did this book come about and how does this all connect to the media experiences of black women in Britain? I noticed in the chat that there's some people here today who've attended some of my other talks. So some of this might be very familiar. Some of this might be a uh, repetition, but today what I would like to speak a little bit more about, which I haven't done so previously, is thinking about how the internal politics within the British context impacts the lives of black women in Britain in various ways. And this is something that I've, I've tried to deal with in my book when thinking about how regional differences affect black women's lives when thinking about not only what it means to be a black woman in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, but what it might mean to be a black woman in a rural part of those different places or what it might mean to be a black woman in a town as opposed to a capital city. So this involved me doing a PhD that was focusing on black women's media experiences in Britain and this was from around about 2015 to 2018. Initially, when I started doing this work, I was really interested in how black women in Britain were represented on television. And um, that still is something I'm interested in and is something that I looked into. But the main way that I tried to explore the different ways that black women in Britain were being represented on TV at that time was by doing interviews with black women. And immediately once I started to do these interviews, what became very apparent was just how many people felt as though mainstream media wasn't offering meaningful, nuanced depictions of black women. Narratives that related to black women in the media were often incredibly derogatory. They were very much based on damaging stereotypes. They were never created by black women. They, they always involved treating black women as though they were nothing more than a way to attract audience numbers. And because of that, many people I spoke to said they were turning away from mainstream media. They were actively turning away from television and they were going online to try and find or create depictions of black women themselves or try to find and create new stories about black women. So this work has involved me thinking a lot about the notion of black cultural transmission and consciousness raising. And although my work predominantly focuses on what happens in Britain, I'm very much interested in the different ways that black diasporic connections impact black women's lives in Britain and elsewhere. So I've also been thinking a bit about digital forms of work and labor and different forms of knowledge production and sharing. And I'm well aware that many people who are here today this is going to be very familiar um, uh, very familiar in terms of possibly some of your own experiences and a lot of the work that, that you might be doing yourself. And because of that, what I want to really get to grips with today is not only thinking about how black women experience digital spaces, how they use digital technology, but thinking about within the context of Britain and dealing with some of the power dynamics we see at play between the nations within it, what it can mean to, to then try and struggle against not only the, the dominant narratives that we see, which very much involve 
treating black women in incredibly harmful ways, but also the lack of media depictions that are out there that maybe focus on the lives of black women in Wales or the lives of black women in Scotland. So again, thinking about this relationship between not only media and digital space, but geography and place and power dynamics that exist within Britain, as well as the various ways that, that Britain has actually inflicted many forms of harm and oppression to people and places elsewhere. So one of the key statements that I often refer to when trying to sum up my work and not ramble on too long about it is that I am really interested in the different ways that Black women's digital experiences are shaped by tensions between digital cultures, potentially communal, countercultural and commercial qualities. And I say potentially there because the reality is the way someone experiences a digital space, the way one person might experience an element of digital culture can be very different to how somebody else experiences that. And with a lot of my own work, I will say, even though I'm referring to digital throughout this talk, I'm quite often speaking about what goes on in different social media sites with regards to online content sharing platforms, but I'm also thinking about other elements of digital journalism too. The images on this slide, and um, before I, I, I move on to the next one, these relate to the different ways that I tried to make use of creative and self-reflexive methods when doing this work. So the PhD process itself, which mainly involved me doing interviews, also entailed me journaling, um, writing poetry, a lot of very bad <laughs> poetry, um, ex experimenting with creative writing. And a lot of that stuff I never ended up including in, in terms of publications or sharing publicly, because for me it was, it was as much about maintaining a sense of feeling grounded whilst doing this work and thinking through my experience of doing this work and also reflecting on the, the different challenges involved in doing this work too. So whether that is challenges to do with forms of structural oppression within different academic institutions or challenges in terms of encountering people who will question the value or the significance of doing any sort of work that focuses on the lives of black women. And this is where I find myself turning often to creative methods. So that might be drawing through um, a really hard day. It might be, it, making use of, of, of paint or photography to try and think about what I was working on and, and moving away from words at different points in the process. So there will be a reading list that accompanies this teaching and there are so many things that I want to include on in that so I'm going to try and, and, and not make it the lengthiest thing out there but I just wanted to highlight some of the, the key key creatives, activists, scholars, writers, and um, books, literature, work out there that has been so incredible in terms of learning more about the lives of Black women around the world, and in particular learning about Black women's digital and media experiences. So for me, Black feminist and Black cyber feminist work has been so, so vital. So that's thinking about the work of people such as Kishana Gray, thinking about that articulation of Black cyber feminism, which offered a way to understand not only the ways that sexism, racism, anti-Blackness and misogyny impact Black women, but thinking about the, the different ways that this manifests in digital spaces. And also thinking about the, the brilliant and innovative ways that Black women are making use of digital technology, thinking about those moments of joy, creativity, thinking about knowledge production and sharing and a sense of collectiveness. And again, you know, the, the work of Moya Bailey has been so, so important in terms of recognizing what, what misogynoir means, recognizing what it means to face these intersecting forms of oppression that are often ignored and obscured within many, many mainstream, and I say mainstream with sort of quotation marks around that, because essentially we know this often means predominantly white, um, but many mainstream media, political, um, creative, even some activist um, and academic spaces. So work to do with black cyber feminism, work to do with black women's digital experiences has been so, so important in terms of trying to understand the different ways that black women in Britain experience the internet, how what they do and say online is responded to in certain ways and how their safety is always very much um, at, at, at risk and how, how their safety can never be guaranteed. 
I also wanted to highlight the really, really foundational um, and fantastic book, Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain. When this book was republished a couple of years ago, it was so wonderful to get a chance to, to hear more from the very people who, who, who wrote this, the very people who experienced what was being discussed uh, in this book, and to think about the specifics of being a Black woman in Britain, to think about the colonial legacy that Britain often tries to pretend does not exist, to think about the different ways that Black women have been struggling against forms of oppression in Britain for such a long time. So if I was to try and refer to sort of key types of writing and research and work that I often come back to, this is thinking about Black feminism, Black cyber feminism in particular, thinking about critical race and digital studies, digital Blackness and digital diaspora, and Black lives in Britain. So as I said, there'll be a reading list that accompanies this. I could speak at length about all these books and also the, the brilliant work of, of people such as Meredith Clark, um, Catherine Knight-Steele, um, Sarah J. Jackson, Safia Noble, Ruha Benjamin, and also the brilliant Black digital work that is happening in, in Britain by individuals such as Keisha Bruce and Rihanna Walcott and many more people. But it was just to sort of pause at this point in the teaching and to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the, the many people whose ongoing extensive and dedicated work has very much been one of the, the reasons why I'm able to do what I, what I do today. So from the thesis to the book, I thought that there might be people who are attending this today or who are here or who engage with this at a later stage who are maybe interested in finding out a little bit about that process of moving from this sort of PhD thesis to trying to write a book and I will caveat this by saying you know I, I, I'm still an early career researcher and that's the sort of term that tends to be used in Britain for somebody who finished their PhD over the last few years or so that I will say how that term is used um, can, can vary. But yeah, I, I still have relatively limited experience, but I thought that it might be useful for me to share what experience I do have in terms of thinking about um, chain, mo moving away from the sort of thesis, thesis format and, and how you might expand on work that you've done when writing a book, which sometimes, depending on the process, can involve a lot less constraints in, in, in constraints in terms of the sort of work that you really want to do, how you want to write about it, thinking less about the sometimes rigid structure that students need to, to conform to to some extent when trying to, to get through that doctoral process. So for me, when I had the time to sort of think about what had changed since I first started doing this work in 2015, and when I had the great chance to work on this book and delve into archives, for example, I found myself focusing a lot less on the content of media representations and a lot more on the politics and power dynamics that impact black women's experiences of work, labor and digital technologies and spaces. So to be honest, I think we can't really look at one without the other representations without power and, and, and politics. But I do feel as though um, sort of moving from the thesis to the book, I had more time and more space and more freedom to let my mind wander at different points and to spend time looking at material in archives and um, that I hadn't had a chance to, to visit earlier on in the research process. So this also involved me trying to account for more of the history of Black women's experiences of media and activism in Britain. And this also meant that I, I had the chance to look at material in the Spare Rib Digital Archive, which I might be um, I'd like to think I was wrong, but I believe that um, that's no longer available because I, th I think one of the reasons it was in place was to do with funds that were, were um, compromised by the fact that Britain is well, has exited um, the EU. That could be a whole longer conversation, so I'm not going to fall down the rabbit hole of speaking all about Brexit, but it was just to say that this digital archive was fantastic. There might still be stuff out there. Um, but yeah, I had the chance to, to look through this, to look at the different ways that Black feminists have been organising to change the way that they experience the media industry in Britain, to change the narratives that they tend to be represented within. And I also spent time at the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton, London, and um, BCA, which again is such a, a, an incredible place. 
and one of the few places in Britain where th there is such a huge amount of archival material that focuses specifically on the lives of Black people in the UK. So where is this work located? By now it's probably pretty obvious, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time speaking about Britain and its pretty thorny internal dynamics. So for me, it was always really necessary that my work involved recognition of the differences between Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and England and the various regions within them. So here I'm thinking a bit about the work of Leah Basil and Akugla Majulu in terms of the experiences of minority women in relation to austerity in Britain and France, they focused on in this book. But also thinking about, for example, how the, the lives of black women in Scotland um, might be different because of the, the nature of politics in that area to do with the also relationship between Scotland and England um, and, and to do with the different ways, as I'll go on to speak about, that Scotland is sometimes positioned as being apparently less racist than other places. Emphasis on apparently. So I was trying to think about the differences between the notion of being British and being in Britain as well. I wanted to avoid negating the experiences of black women in Britain who primarily identify with a sense of nationhood located outside of Britain, as well as the experiences of those who do not identify with any notion of nationhood or citizenship. And at this point in the book, which is quite early on, I draw on the work of Ruha Benjamin here, who provides a really great explanation of, of sort of transactional models of citizenship where we see citizenship being very much attached to consumerism, to do with spending power, to do with um, buying and browsing online. And when we reflect on the different ways throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, that in, in Britain at least, people have been encouraged to try and maintain or revitalize the economy by, by buying, by going out to eat, by purchasing things, we see that really worrisome and clear connection between ideas of citizenship or notions of what it is to be a so-called good citizen and feeding into consumerism and capitalism, which we know is, is very much a structure that <laughs> oppresses Black people in, in so many different ways. So when thinking about what it means to be a Black woman in Britain, I was trying to also consider that there are times when, when Black women in Britain are just sort of collectively referred to as British in a way that very much um, dismisses the, the different experiences that people have, including experiences that are shaped by experiences of migration, of um, experiences of asylum seeking, of experiences of, of being denied any notion of citizenship at different points in their life. So I've been doing some ongoing work that really deals with the lives of Black people in Scotland and um, with a friend and independent researcher and um, organiser, writer and activist, Leila Roxanne Hill. And as part of this work, we've been thinking about what it means to see Scotland often represented as a supposedly post-racial utopia in comparison to England and other parts of Britain. And when this happens, it is an incredibly inaccurate portrayal of Scotland, and it dismisses the reality of racism, anti-Blackness, colonialism, and Scotland's involvement in the British Empire. So for, for some sort of background context information that might be helpful, I was born in Scotland and lived there for over 20 years, and I'm now based in Wales, and my mum's side of the family is actually Welsh, and both Scotland and Wales are devolved nations within Britain, whereby we, I think there are some interesting par parallels in terms of how conversations to do with colonialism do and don't unfold. And what I mean by that is, and I'll, I'll speak a bit more about this as I move on to the next slide, um, because of the hierarchical dynamics between England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, where the dominance of England and the different ways that Welsh, Northern Irish and Scottish people um, and their histories have been impacted by the, the hegemony of England essentially, sometimes conversations to do with colonialism solely focus on the power relations between the nations within Britain, as opposed to there being any meaningful acknowledgement of what colonialism means in terms of the British Empire and all that has, um, all, all, all that, that involved in terms of harms being 
inflicted upon black people, harms being inflicted upon people elsewhere, and forms of colonialism, which at the end of the day, nations within Britain benefited from, um, regardless of whether or not they feel as though they are facing oppression from England because of the power dynamics at play. We could speak about this for hours and I hope that I'm making some sense when I discuss this because I, I know lots of people have different opinions and I'm going to go on to sort of summarise why I think it's necessary when talking about colonialism and speaking about the lives of black people in Britain that we make time and space to recognise the different ways that colonialism is or isn't acknowledged within these various nations. So acknowledging the existence of racism in Scotland is not revolutionary. Yet naming and examining racism in Scotland can pose a threat to the palatable post-racial position that is sometimes strategically projected onto the nation, whether that's by people involved in sort of the tourism industry, in political spaces, higher education as well. I think it is always going to be an ongoing battle to try and push against this myth that Scotland is somehow less um, racist, less um, oppressive, less of a challenging place for black women to be than other parts of Britain or other parts of the world. And we have seen some changes since last year, which again, we could discuss at greater length, um, but there are still many issues in, in terms of, of people actually recognising the existence of anti-black racism in Scotland and doing it in a way that involves listening to black people. So what I'm talking about with all this is moving beyond this myth of Scottish exceptionalism. And again, the same might, could, could possibly be said of, of places, including Wales. Imperialist dynamics in Britain between its constitutive nations due to the dominance of England are not the same as the specific forms of oppression and violence that Britain, including Scotland, have inflicted on people and places elsewhere. Still, it's crucial to acknowledge how the legacy of interconnected issues concerning British Empire, internal power relations, colonialism, the transatlantic slave trade, and anti-Black violence impact Black people in Britain, including in devolved nations for calls for independence from the UK grow. So what I mean by this is I think we need to be having both of these conversations at the same time. We, we can't be erasing the involvement of Scotland in the British Empire, its colonial legacy, the, the different ways that its contemporary economy has been shaped by the actions of enslavers. But we also need to be speaking about the power dynamics that exist between the nations within Britain and what that all means for Black people in different parts of Britain today. So I mentioned at the start that I'm interested in how the regional experiences of Black people can very much influence how they do or don't have access to digital media, to digital technology. And one of the people that I interviewed as part of my work spoke about the fact that they had lived most of their life somewhere with generated electricity, which means that the electricity goes off. There have been no neighbours, so it's fairly remote. And my mother's mother would make video recordings from films that were on television. So I thought that it was helpful for me to share this because sometimes when conversations to do with Black digital experiences occur, I think that those conversations can happen in a way that imply all Black people have access to a laptop, to the internet, to consistent Wi-Fi, to electricity. And sometimes there is a lack of discussion of what it means to be a Black person in a rural part of Britain, what it means to to have a very different experience that maybe digital culture isn't at the centre of and how those sorts of experiences are sometimes obscured or, or even denied as part of the conversations that happen to do with Black women and the media in Britain. And thinking more about regionality and rurality, here I've got an excerpt from a piece by Leila Roxanne Hill to do with why doesn't our media look like this? And this piece is again, wrestling with some of these questions to do with different parts of Britain and, and which parts of Britain tend to be at the centre of national media coverage. So representation of local news from smaller regions and towns beyond the central belt in Scotland or main cities still struggle to make it into new independent media. And although the statement is in relation to Scotland, it's also applicable to other parts of Britain where there are greater amounts of monetary, political and societal focus on media content stemming from large cities. So I think even when we do see 
perhaps more of a discussion within the media in Britain of the lives of people in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland, or even the, the, the lives of black people in these places, quite often it will still be capital cities that are foregrounded. It will be large cities. It's very rare that we, we hear about the lives of black people in rural parts of Scotland. It's very rare that we hear about the, the lives of black people in, in, in towns um, within UK that are perhaps not very commonly discussed um, or, or perhaps perceived as being small in size. So there are regionally distinct black experiences and identities, and they're rarely meaningfully acknowledged amid mainstream media and politics, you could argue, depending on, on which political spheres we're speaking about in Britain. So what does all of this have to do with black feminism and the media? So when I was really looking at different archived sources, different books, different pamphlets, different zines, different bulletins and brochures, what was so obvious was there were many different examples of how black women have been collectively organizing to try and address the material conditions, racial capitalism and intersecting forms of oppression that black women face for, you know, for decades in Britain. I think sometimes the current conversations to do with inequalities, to do with oppression and to do with the media, sometimes the focus on, on digital without historicizing what has come before means that there isn't enough consideration of the work that has, has already happened, the legacy of black women resisting what's going on and trying to address the different ways that media processes, narratives and depictions are implicated in this. So a black feminist approach to, to dealing with how you know, the media is experienced by black women, how the media portrays black women, it's always about more than just the politics of representation, but the politics of representation is also at play here too. And when I say it's always about more than just the politics of representation, what I mean is it's always not only about images on screens and um, who, who's more likely to feature where, but it's also about the production processes, work and labor conditions. And at this point, it's helpful for me to think about the really, really um, wonderful book left of Karl Marx, The Political Life of Black Communist Claudia Jones by Carol Boyce Davies. And this quote, I think, is really helpful in terms of remembering you know, the, the, the many ways that black women have tried to create alternative and more radical forms of media, but also reckoning with the fact that you could say there's quite a lack of that right now. So this quote, today as corporate journalism, embedded reporters and mass media control via television have become the dominant modes of communication, the absence of more radical media is noticeable. And a question that we could maybe consider is to what extent has digital media, has social media enabled or obstructed um, more radical forms of media that black women in Britain could benefit from? So all of this is to do with black women's media history in Britain. And when doing this research, I was thinking a lot about the fact that as I've already mentioned, there has been a real understanding of power relations embedded in ICT for a long time among black women. And there have been critiques of how these power relations um, impact different people. So long before the rise of online content sharing platforms and social media, such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, we have seen these legacies of self and collective organizing and these must be remembered and that's not to take away from the wonderful examples of contemporary collective organizing and you know contemporary forms of collaborative creative work that we see black women doing it's just ensuring that we connect those dots between what has already happened what came before what's what's occurring in this moment and what we might see in the future so I now wanted to spend some time thinking about another interview with somebody who spoke of their frustration at the, the lack of meaningful support that they saw within the media industry in terms of organizations and institutions responding when they see um, black women experiencing harm and experiencing violence because of the visibility that might be involved in them working in the media. 
So in this case, the person that I spoke to is a black Muslim woman in Scotland who had been approached to take part in a media opportunity. And she wanted to pursue a career in this area and she was really conflicted about what to do and decided not to take up the opportunity because she said she was all too aware of the forms of harassment, abuse and risk that would probably be involved in her being visible, specifically in the context of Scotland, where, you know, there is just such a glaring absence um, of, of, of depictions of, of black women in various news and media spaces. And in this case, you know, she would be involved in this speaking as herself and speaking as a public figure and, and speaking as a black African woman who she said was conscious of how her accent would be received by those who are xenophobic, anti-black, sexist, misogynistic and Islamophobic. So this whole conversation was just a real reminder of the futility of media industry diversity initiatives that are marketed as enabling black people's entry into careers in the industry but which fail to identify institutional measures to actually support such individuals in the likely event that their hypervisibility in the media leads to abuse. And this isn't just abuse from the public, this is also um, abuse that can happen within the organizations, of course. And the person I was speaking to spoke at length about being aware of how this would be impacted by colorism, by misogyny, by the, the different ways that even when we do see a black person depicted in Scotland, it tends to be a black person with a, a Scottish accent, or it tends to be a light skinned black person whose perceived embodied sense of blackness is very much within this sort of palatable post-racial imaginary that is sometimes projected onto Scotland. So this whole conversation is one of many which just highlights the, the inadequacy of media industry diversity schemes, which imply that all black women need is a help to enter that environment. And which also often imply that black women just need more training or more leadership advice in order to, or, um, in order to navigate these spaces. When we know that the issues at, at stake are forms of institutional harm, they're forms of obstruction. It's nothing to do with a lack of ability or interest or motivation or skills on the part of black women. So throughout this whole process of thinking about, learning about and doing research to do with the digital and media experience as a black woman in Britain, I've been thinking a lot about the relationship or tension between notions of community, creativity and commodification. And many of the women that I interviewed spoke about being concerned by the potential for public discussions that they have on social media to be used and mined by non-Black individuals and institutions in search of material for article pitches and content that connects to Black cultural references, but without involving or crediting Black people, especially Black women. And again, this is where I think the work of Moya Bailey and the work of Trudy as well, and misogynoir and all that that means is, is really important for us to connect to, to think about when making sense of what the, the Black women I interviewed um, spoke, spoke of when discussing what it, it meant to, to do a lot of public knowledge production, to do a lot of, um, you know, theorizing online, but to know that there was the potential for all of this digital work and labor that they were doing as Black women in Britain to essentially result in non-Black individuals or commercial institutions trying to pass that work and labor off as though it was their own. And another piece of writing that is really central to my understanding of all of this is this piece by Aziza Johnson, who does such phenomenal work on not only black geographies, but so much to do with what it means to be a, a black woman in Britain, what it means to be a black Muslim woman, and also what it means to do this sort of work within the confines of various academic institutions. So this piece refuting how the other half lives, I am a woman's right, which uh, I am a woman's rights, which also makes connection and um, a really great connection to black women radical work as well, involves this brilliant statement. When black feminists are asked to bear the brunt of the labor for the purposes of educating those who reproduce normative whiteness, I have to ask who's actually being centered here. And I feel like these words, and um, really connect to this concern around what it means to be visible online, what it means to 
take part in forms of digital work and labour or even to, to, to do things in digital spaces that might not be viewed as work or labour, but which are certainly not meant to enable the profits of corporate entities, um, but which, which somehow along the way become maybe repackaged as a teachable moment or become repackaged as a source of knowledge that people who want to learn how to be anti-racist can turn to. And there's this real question around to return to these words of Johnson and, um, you know, educating and, and the potential reproduction of normative whiteness as well. Who is actually being centered here in these different digital experiences of black women? And to what extent do these digital spaces offer opportunities to feel a sense of joy, to feel a sense of collectiveness, to feel a sense of connectedness to people, as opposed to being very extractive in nature and involving a lot of forms of monitoring and hyper surveillance, including by the very social media companies um, that are behind these platforms. So I'm conscious at this point that might not all sound very positive, um, but I think the last thing we need is to be in denial about the reality of what it can mean to be a black woman online and also to recognize the fact that different black women experience different digital spaces in different ways so i think it's always really useful to pause and speak about the fact that not all black women are engaging in digital spaces from an activist place not all black women are black feminists or afro feminists Actually, some black women can um, be involved in spaces that are incredibly harmful for other black women. And all of this is shaped by issues to do with classism, to do with colorism, to do with homophobia, to do with transphobia. So whilst there are opportunities for black women in Britain to make use of digital media as part of forms of co-creation and um, to, to sort of make our own spaces, to make our own DIY spaces and to turn to the words of this person who I interviewed, make our own iconography and make our own content. And um, it's really important that we carve out our own narratives and that we don't shy away from creating spaces for ourselves. While there is the opportunity for all of this, there's a real question around who's most likely to be able to, to benefit from the elements of, of digital culture or digital technology that, that can be positive in, in different black women's lives who is most likely to face these forms of vitriolic abuse and harm and less likely to receive protection. And this is where we come back to the fact it's not only about anti-black racism and, and sexism and misogyny, there are so many other issues, including ableism, including um, classism and so forth, which mean that there is no such thing as, as one black woman's sort of collective digital experience. We're always speaking about both similarities and differences as part of this conversation. So I'm gonna to move towards the end of my talk, hopefully sooner rather than later, so that there's enough time for us to have conversations. But this is another person who I, I spoke to. And at this point, the conversation was to do with creative and cultural industry organizations and to do with the different ways that they do or don't represent um, black women, how they, how they claim to be supportive of black women. And this person spoke about a particular well-known high profile organization and said that they tried to indicate to this organization that they're not representing in their words and they're not representing me and my brothers and sisters black and brown in the UK. They said we've got and then the organization named one black woman employee as if that means they can't in any way and um, be oppressive towards black women. And the person I spoke to said, I say all this in relation to how they use media. As I noticed on their Instagram, they'll often have an image of a black person sat outside looking like they were minding their own business. They've instrumentalized this young black person. And we had a lot of conversations about the spectacularization and instrumentalization of images of black people in Britain. And this was actually before this, this conversation, I think was in 2019 or even um, 2018. And so this is before last year where we've seen this surge in terms of organizations wanting to be perceived as supporting um, black people, wanting to put a black face to a campaign, wanting to pepper their adverts um, with, with more images of black people. And I say all this fairly cynically because I think it's yet to be determined how many organizations are actually gonna make significant changes um, in response to galvanizing Black Lives Matter and Black liberationist organizing in 2020. 
This same person who I spoke to also went on to discuss issues to do with digital censorship and abuse. So they were now speaking about social media and why they, they really don't like social media. They, they really feel that there's a lot of spectacularization and superficiality and bullying. They said this social media is not a decolonized space. It's, a, it's not a safe space. These platforms can censor people speaking their truths about racism often. If you talk about whiteness, there seems to be algorithms that try to shut that conversation down. So they went on to say how talking about decolonial processes or talking about racism in a language that they do not deem as acceptable means that you're shut down from having the conversation and how this majorly contrasts with the different ways we see white supremacists, we, we see various individuals who are at the root of forms of hate speech being able to exist in digital spaces um, with, with a, a real lack of digital censorship that some of the black women I spoke about have experienced themselves. So moving towards the end of this, this stage of the teaching and thinking about the black digital diasporic element of what was going on in terms of all that I spoke about with other black women, I was thinking a lot about the notion of digital blackness. So here and um, connecting to the work also of Andre Brock and um, thinking about questions to do with, with borders, to do with boundaries, to do with a perceived politics of difference and to do a black digital dialogue between Britain and the US. So this involved me spending some time trying to conceptualize the borders of experiences of black identity. So that's thinking about the different ways black identity is perceived or defined in different parts of the world. And also thinking about what constitutes a border, how borders are constructed, perceptions of them, how all of this impacts black lives in cyberspace and the surrounding political landscapes. So the digital experiences of black people are always far from being borderless. They're shaped by physical and virtual geographies and many layers of power and politics, despite what is sometimes suggested in terms of this idea of being able to transcend borders and boundaries. That said, there are many examples of forms of transnational black solidarity and the, the work of Sarah J. Jackson, Moya Bailey and Brooke Foucault Wells on hashtag activism, I know deals a lot in terms of, um, you know, clarifying the, the impact of what people do online, clarifying the impact of forms of solidarity um, across countries, across continents, and the different ways that activist movements um, de develop in ways shaped by social media, shaped by hashtags, and shaped by a sense of collectiveness that can be supported by digital technology and digital tools at certain points in time. So we could speak a lot more about black digital diaspora. I'm really interested in the different ways that um, black American popular culture and black American culture impacts the lives of black people in Britain. How, again, not only Twitter, and, and I'm here, I'm, I'm thinking about the work of Meredith Clark on, on black Twitter, but yeah, thinking about how different social media sites and online content sharing platforms are part of this notion of black digital diaspora. But while digital spaces can be a vital source of collective building, the potential for social media to contribute to a sense of solidarity and community is sometimes fetishized in ways that evade recognition of the difficulties that can be involved in collective building and the importance of many physical spaces in the collective organizing and lives of black women. So this is just me always stopping to remember that just because something's not visible online, just because it's not being posted about on Twitter, doesn't mean it's not happening. Doesn't mean that there aren't so many forms of black feminist and Afro-feminist um, liberationist efforts and work that are occurring out of sight and away from the digital spaces that I've maybe spoken about quite a bit today. And again, as I mentioned earlier on, with all of this, it is always going to be necessary to, to, to avoid assuming the politics of black women, to remember that not every black woman will identify as a black feminist, will be involved in activist work of any sort. And what that then means in terms of not projecting and assume politics onto what black women or different black women in different parts of the world are saying and doing online. So finally, um, before we have time for a, a bit of a, a, a conversation with all of you who are here, the rise of brand vote washing, thinking about these connections between black women's digital experiences and how brands misuse commercialized notions of feminism, commercialized notions of equality and black social justice activism as part of marketing that 
reframes, flattens and denies what liberationist politics is. And you could say this is also quite applicable to how some academic disciplines have attempted to rebrand as anti-racist overnight, or maybe rather than academic disciplines, how, how academia in general has tried to rebrand as anti-racist overnight, thinking about in 2020, so many claims about reckonings that were occurring. And here I just want to signpost this brilliant piece of work by Aziza Johnson on throwing our bodies against the white background of academia, which is a, a, a really brilliant piece of writing which points to some of these forms of anti-black violence that are very much um, normalized within different academic contexts. And I'm just thinking about this a lot when I see the statements that institutions are issuing, when I see claims about changes occurring, and I'm questioning whether or not these changes are going to be meaningful in, in any way. So when dealing with this notion of the rise of brand vote washing, I'm also looking at how brands monitor black women's digital activities and respond to or attempt to replicate them in ways intended to frame the brand as woke. And again, I'm saying here woke, I'm using that term in a way that is very much emptied of meaning. This mainstreamed notion of wokeness, which is arguably attached to ideas of consumerism, is arguably also attached to discussions of identity politics that feed into far right perspectives. So all of this has involved me thinking also about how brands will, for example, express an interest in black pound days, but they'll still maintain harmful work and labor practices. They're still brands that are supported by the existence of racial capitalism, and they're not substantially supporting black liberationist work. So how can we make sense of the ways we see brands trying to enter into discussions to do with social justice activism and doing it in a way that distracts from and can dilute the significance of grassroots work that is occurring. So the last slide um, is just me speaking a bit about a piece of work that was recently published. So this piece of mine, it's an open access article through television and new media. And I've been exploring digital racism and how this relates to online representations of black people and associated racist marketplace logics. So this draws a lot on the work of many of the people I've spoken about today and others who feature on the reading list that will accompany this. So I've been thinking about racist digital practices, the remediation of blackness in the service of brands. And this has also involved thinking about computer generated imagery and um, so CGI racialized online influencers, the spectacularization of black pain and lives and different digital marketing approaches um, including digital blackface and how, how brands are very much feeding into forms of anti-black digital racism whilst claiming to be allies and anti-racist um, because of a very empty statement that they post once in a while. Thank you very much for your time and I just want to say another huge thank you to, to Jamie and um, to everybody who's here and I'm looking forward to having a conversation with everybody for the rest of the time that we have left today. Thanks again. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Soban. This was an excellent, excellent teaching. Um, and forgive me if you hear any background noise where I am, it's uh, the the, a pickup truck, <laughs> but I really appreciate all your work and and the th and a thorough analysis on you know different and varying topics about identity politics, uh, black women, uh, uh, activism, organizing nation. What what does it mean to be a citizen or non citizen um, and and media representation? So thank you, thank you so much for this excellent uh, teaching. And I'm gonna stay off because I would like the focus to really be on you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some of the questions and comments that people have for you. Um, and so the Thank first you. one, um, someone asked, and I'm forgive me if I'm saying your name cor incorrectly, when, when Juku, um, but what are your thoughts on what is, has been described as overt pandering by major UK supermarkets during their Christmas advertisements in light of the BLM movement over the summer? So I've got a lot of thoughts and I, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. And um, I think what I'll maybe focus on now is whilst, whilst it can be encouraging for different people. And I think particularly when I think about and children and when I think about the various ways that media depictions can sometimes impact and um, children can it impact their self perceptions can impact how others treat them as well can impact how, how black children are treated. I think that it, 
it can be encouraging to see more images of black families, to see images of black love, to see images of black relationships. But what I think is really worrying is seeing the different ways that those organizations, those supermarkets or companies um, sometimes fail to respond to the horrific forms of online violence and abuse that we see occur as a result of them simply deciding to depict more than one black person in a campaign. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying there is I don't want to, to diminish the sense of encouragement that people will sometimes feel when maybe feeling as though they see themselves, particularly children, I will say. Um, but I will always be questioning who that representation serves and you know, what company is behind that campaign? What are they selling? How do they treat the people that they, um, that, that, that they employ? Um, how are they gonna respond to the, the online trolls who are going to force us to see a hashtag trending because of the outrage that surrounds those images appearing in campaigns? Um, so yeah, I guess I, it's not that I would say I discourage those campaigns and their existence, but I always wonder what do they mean beyond surface level symbolism and representations and how much do they really benefit black people? For sharing that, um, another question was, you've spoken about local personal scale responses, um, for example, do it yourself st storytelling to counter the media's problematic portrayal of the black experience at scale. What do you think is needed to bridge this gap between small scale interventions like do it, your tell, do it yourself storytelling and at scale systemic changes? Wow, I wish I had the answer for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what I'll say is, is it's not so much an answer, but it's, it's my thoughts on it. I think what is unfortunate is for me, a lot of the incredibly um, valuable and community engaged and community centered work that we see to do with digital media to do with media happens at, at a, a local level and at a small grassroots level which rarely involves a significant amount of funding of resources often involves people doing a lot of unpaid work or being very precariously employed and sometimes I worry that the conversations that we have to do with what what, what we might view as mainstream media and these large media institutions doesn't involve us critiquing the lack of support that we see for more local efforts um, or, or involves us implying that the only way we're gonna see change happen is if the hyper-global media organizations with a lot of money do things differently, as opposed to figuring out ways we can support those individuals who've been doing such brilliant work for so, so long at more of a local level. But what I, what I will also say, just thinking about it, some, some of those structural changes, if those were to happen, might, it might involve them filtering down um, to, to result in more support at a, at a local level. So I'm just thinking for me, one of those structural changes is sort of the decentering of the, the dominance of large cities within Britain, but also in particular in England, within what is referred to as the British media landscape. Quite often conversations to do with British media only really involve focusing on a handful of cities and very few of those cities are, are outside of England. Thank you so much for, for sharing um, your response to that and for uh, that question. Um, Natalie has a question. I think this is very interesting. Um, what do you think the immediate and long-term effects of the commodification of blackness and black activism by brands media outlets, et cetera, will have on black minds, communities, and spaces? I mean, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for all these incredible questions because they're, they're making me um, think so much. And also it's, it's so clear that there are so many people here with, with in incredible answers and thoughts to share themselves. The long-term impact, one of my biggest worries is that we see the complete distortion of what activism is. So I think we're already seeing moments when, um, you know, commerce driven influencer culture is being conflated with activism or when global brands with a track record of 
awful work and labor practices that involve the mistreatment. Mistreatment isn't even the word. The the oppression and and and, and sort of violence inflicted on on black people and, and black people in different parts of the world. Suddenly, the brand puts out a glossy campaign, and their image seems to be rehabilitated. Rehabilitated. So that's not to. That's not to be dismissive of the fact that many people are savvy to what brands are doing. There are many people who are critical of this. You know, I'm, I'm far from being the only person to be saying this. I'm well aware of that. But I still do worry that we will see certain brands being able to dodge um, those moments when they are involved in something incredibly harmful because of the, the sheen of their campaign, because they're ticking boxes in terms of the number of, of Black people represented in a campaign. And that we're going to see more conversations happening, which make clear people are people's understanding of activism is sometimes based more so on a commodified notion of it than what liberationist politics suggests activism should be about. You know what that reminded me of, um, of when uh, Kendall Jenner did that commercial mm -hmm. with uh, I don't I forget what brand it was a Pepsi. Pepsi. Yeah. And how it tried to just show this like simple depiction of her going up to a police officer um, and handing this police officer a Pepsi mm -hmm. um, that it would alleviate all uh, instances or structural racism mm -hmm. and, and all sorts of things and how the, com the watering down of what activism is. Uh, yeah, I think that was such a, a very thoughtful response. Um, Thank you so much. Thanks. So Andrea asked, uh, thank you for this incredible talk. Is there anywhere I can read your work on brand woke washing? And she, excuse me, Andrea, I'm sorry. Um, Andrea mentions that Pepsi and Sprite have been putting in money into black organizations. How does this relate to their woke washing? Can it be seen as an attempt at reparations? So in the in the reading list, I'll, I'll include some um, links to my stuff on, on, on woke washing and more recently this stuff to do with digitally digital branded representations of black people and blackness, in particular thinking about the rise of various sort of racialized um, CGI influencers. And I know that great, you know, there's great work that's already been done on that, and um, which I refer to, including the work of um, Lauren Michelle Jackson. But in terms of how does how do we see things complicated by the fact that some of these organizations do do fund different groups i mean the last thing i would say is that i mean reparations is a whole other conversation but the last thing i would say is that any form of moving closer towards liberationist goals and freedom for black people the last thing i'd say is that that's ever going to be led by commercial organizations so whilst i can i see value in moments when commercial brands will, will put their funds elsewhere. I definitely don't see that as being like this sort of revolutionary redistribution of resources or funds or dismantling of the very capitalist structures that make those brands possible. And um, I, I, I think that the cynical part of me thinks that the, the, the gesture of providing funds is often very much beneficial to the organization providing those funds and that offering money in support of different groups is never going to be enough to distract from the different ways these brands are part of the problem and um, especially when we see those gestures occurring after the critique that might surround a campaign and also I think it's important to pay close attention to who or what they are funding or supporting so again I think reflecting on that question to do with local work oftentimes smaller groups or things that are happening at a local level are less likely to receive funds and supports from anybody um, or funds and support from anybody or from any any organization and sometimes it's the, the same few few groups that commercial brands will will offer funds to um, and it's not to say that those funds are, aren't necessarily going to places that um, will use those funds in, in in a helpful way and and to strive towards liberationist goals but there can almost become this fetishization of specific organizations that commercial brands want to be associated with because it benefits their brand image rather than them being that concerned about tackling anti-blackness and white supremacy. Definitely. Um, thank you for that too. And uh, Laulu, forgive me if I'm saying your name incorrectly, but uh, you asked an amazing question and, and I'm looking forward to Dr. Saban's response, but 
Um, the question is Re and SARS and Beyonce and Black Lives Matter. What are your thoughts on the spectatorship of distant suffering, especially when individuals and movements from the global South self-produce these images consciously and strategically? Do these appeals to Western sympathies reinforce or question the centering of America and the West in contemporary liberationist discourse? Well, I feel like we could have a whole teaching on this question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm maybe gonna try and pick a part of it and say, um, okay, it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not sure if, if this connects to the question well, but I think that, so some of the conversations happening right now maybe relate to this. I think sometimes there is the implication that black people can't be in, complicit in forms of colonialism or that black people particularly, and this is now thinking about issues to do with citizenship, thinking about what it is to, to have certain passports, what it is to move through certain um, parts of the world a lot more freely, freely than other black people. And, and what I'm thinking about in relation to this question is that there are those moments when we might see black people in Europe, black people in North America, and, um, you know, moving through different, different places or spaces or traveling through different places or spaces or trying to, to connect to different people and, and cultures in a way that is sort of reinforcing um, hierarchical and, and colonial dynamics. And um, I, I suppose what I'm thinking about in relation to this question is black capitalism and, and those different moments when, you know, whether it's a celebrity or whether it's an individual, somebody is perhaps professing to be upholding a certain political position while seemingly also enabling this or sort of capitalist mechanisms that they say they want to challenge and doing it in a way that is also very much based on living within the context of a perceived global power um, and not critically reflecting on you know what it might mean to have uh, a US passport what it might mean to have a British passport and how that can can involve people and um, black people acting or, or moving in, in different ways that are harmful to other black people in other parts of the world. I'm not sure if that answers the question at all um, but like I said we, we, we could have a whole other teaching about this and also it goes without saying if anybody wants to get in touch and, and ask something else or continue these conversations uh, then I'm, I'm really happy to do that too. Great great thank you for that and although I'm, I'm going to kind of summarize because like, like I know you kind of touched on it before but there are like three questions um, two on the YouTube live chat and one within the Zoom um, Q&A section, really asking like, can these, is there an example of a corporate entity that has done this properly in terms of um, investing or, or, or giving back to the black community particularly um, and, and having this anti-racist discourse without it being um, consumerist or, or capitalist? Like, is there an example or do you even think that there's a way that a corporation can can really enact this without being um, predatory in its capitalist uh, mm. and consumerist behavior. So I I remain and I, I I'm still yet to be convinced that there is a way for any and in particular here speaking about you know high profile global brands and um, I, I, I just don't see how there's a way for them to do this work in the way that is often claimed so whether it's terms such as allyship whether it's terms such as anti-racist I think also you know in thinking about the first part of that question I don't have a clear example because I don't think there there are any <laughs> but what I would say is maybe if those examples do exist it's organizations that are doing this quietly and they're not doing it as part of and PR opportunities. They're not doing it to, to sort of boost their, their image as a brand. They're doing it um, quietly and in a more sustained, committed way that doesn't involve platforming themselves in the process. So there are definitely brands that we could say are more, they're finessing how they do it more effectively, but I don't think that means that what they're doing is any more meaningful in terms of actually supporting um, you know, liberationist goals. I, I mean, brands are part of the structures that we want to see dismantled. And um, if, if, if we're talking about, you know, anti-blackness, we're also talking about capitalism, or we're also talking about um, consumerism. So I don't know, maybe the most meaningful act a brand could do would be to dismantle um, and, and to completely redistribute 
um, those resources in a way that has no bearing on, on that brand itself and in a way that doesn't involve publicity and press. Yeah, that was a great response. That was such a big question too. <laughs> all those different ones okay and I'll do only I know that like I said before I, I don't want you to be speaking for so long but and there's a lot of questions but I think um if, if it's okay with you that I can um you know ask one more question that someone has um so Tanya um asked the cancel culture comment was great how how it could contribute to right-wing messaging can you say a bit more about woke, non-Black people of color or white people using the term cancel culture mm -hmm. to address harm they feel is happening? So my answer to this is quite brief. My answer would be um, cancel culture isn't something that I'm an expert on in any way, but um, Meredith Clark has a fantastic paper that was published um, quite recently exploring um, cancel culture and, and call out culture. So, so, so my response in this case would be that's a, a perfect piece to, to read and one that I'll be on the reading list as well. And I, thanks for that question though too. I think, you know, conversations to do with the ways that cancel culture, identity politics and woke, how those words have been taken up in different media and political spaces over the last few years and the, the relationship between them is, is something that we need to grapple with, especially, especially when seeing words that once were more associated with uh, a, a black activist politics becoming part of the vernacular of the very people who, who don't want to see um, Black people survive and, and, and thrive. Great, well, I just have to say, I'm not sure if anyone can see me, so let me see if I'm back. I can see you. Oh, you can see me, okay. Yeah. I just wanna say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Soban, for such an amazing teaching. You had other questions too, but I'm like, once again, I know you've been speaking for a very, very long time, um, but I just want to thank you. I want to thank everyone who attended. Um, and I want to also thank Nina, our amazing captioner. But I really want to say something to Dr. Soban. I appreciate your work so much. It is a crucial intervention into uh, uh, what we digital publics, digital representation, media, activism, and more. And I think myself and others learned so much um, from your conversation. And I suggest that everybody buy this and support Dr. Soban and her work um, because I, I feel like, um, and I also said this to you during the last conversation, other people saw um, you and Rihanna and Keisha and they said that, wow, we didn't know other people were doing this work. I'm grateful to be connected and, and to know people are doing this work and where I'm feeling seen and I can continue in my research interests. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all that you do and just know that you are truly appreciated. And everyone, yeah. support. Thank you, honestly, thank you for, for all that you do and, and for your support and for all that that is yet to come with, with, with the, the, the work that you're doing. And thank you to everybody who is here right now and for the brilliant questions which you know, I learned so much from the questions alone. I'll be thinking about them for a long time and hopefully speaking to, to some of you in the future too. Thank you. Yes. And thank you. Yes. Thank you for everyone participating. Um, we're excited to have more conversations for our Afrofeminisms in Europe series and thankful to Dr. Saban for being the first event in the series and um, launching it so properly and so wonderfully. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, and we're going about to close out, but this conversation will be on Black Women Radicals YouTube for you to reference. So, and look forward to a reading list shortly. So I'm excited. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you.